Hi, my name is Chris Peters. I live in New Zealand. I'm originally from Belgium, but I've been living in New Zealand for the last 25 years. Um, I'm a software developer and software designer, mainly working in uh, printing and publishing. And uh, I've been doing some automation around EPUB, but also around InDesign and Adobe products and other things. So I was normally going to give a session in Canada at um, Tech Forum, but that didn't happen because of the virus that's ravaging the world. So I decided to try and um, create a session, an online version of my session, and uh, just record it and um, Put, uh, I send it through to Tech Forum to put up uh, on the web. So I wanted to talk about automation. So there's, in my um, view, there's two types of automation that I can see. So it's just a, a way to um, divide the, the playing field into in two big areas. So one is something what I call tools, and the other one is uh, systems. So, and tools are more like a carpenter's tools. So a carpenter might have a hammer, they might have a screwdriver, they might have some nails, they might have a box with uh, screws, they might have a CNC machine, they might have a laser cutter. So some of those tools are complicated tools. They actually have a lot of functionality, but they are still things you just take out and then do some kind of work as part of a bigger job. So they're just very quite specific in the functionality they have. On the other hand, we have systems and systems are more complicated beasts. So I would compare them more to say something like a sawmill, uh, where a sawmill takes in raw material like logs and out at the other end come uh, planks and poles and boards and all kinds of stuff. So the sawmill is a system and within that system, there are smaller systems, subsystems, and eventually uh, there might be certain areas where humans have a function within the system and the humans might then use tools within that uh, system. So a system is bigger and more complex. In publishing, you would quite often talk about a workflow. You, know, like you would say, well, we have a workflow where we just have editorial stuff or um, writers and things get collated and put together and edited and page layout happens and printing happens. So that whole thing is a system. So in this presentation, I want to talk mainly about tools. So tools, and uh, I also want to talk about a more specific type of tool, so, uh, which I would like to call a jig. So I have never heard of anyone naming it a jig in this particular area, but I got the term from a guy called Dan Erlewine, who's a luthier, so a, a guitar builder, guitar repair guy. And he uh, has a lot of interesting YouTube um, movies that I like because I'm interested in guitar repair. And he quite often makes these really interesting little tools that have a very specific function and he calls them jigs. So, and that's essentially pretty much what I'm going to try and do in this session, show you how to make jigs. They're not made out of wood, uh, they're made out of scripts, and, uh, but they're very similar in that they're very task specific, very um, uh, ad hoc. You can just build them almost on the fly, and uh, but you can reuse them. So once you have it, uh, it's just an extra tool in your tool belt. So, before building up to building your own jigs, uh, I want to first touch on a number of tools that you really should think about having in your tool belt. So they're handy to have. And for a number of you, these things might be totally familiar. You might already be using uh, or doing the things I'm going to be mentioning. But if you don't, I really urge you to spend some time to increase the range of tools you have available to you, because in the end, these things do pay off. So they're quite uh, quite handy to have. All right, so 
and these are my course notes. So there, there are some course notes that I'll um, convert into a PDF that are currently still in Word. And I have a lot of uh, interesting links at the end of the course notes. So, and there's a lot of things I'm discussing in my course notes that I'm not going to explicitly go into in this um, online session because that would just make it too long. But um, so you can just read them and actually get more information about the things I'm talking about. Another thing I want to mention is that a lot of the stuff I'll be going over, I'll be going over fairly quickly. And it is not my intention for this session to be a full-fledged course on how to write scripts or how to create regular expressions. It's more that I want to show you what they can do. And I want to show you roughly how I approach them, how I think about them. And you still might not understand, like you might get the gist in seeing what I'm doing. You might not be able to do it yourself and that is totally fine. It's not my intention that you come away from this uh, knowing how to write regular expressions. So you need to put in the time and use the available materials. There's lots of stuff on um, the internet, uh, in YouTube. You can just, uh, there is uh, lynda.com. There's all these resources that could teach you how these things work. So this session is not a course on regular expressions. Uh, it's not a course on scripting. It's more like how to think about these things and what do you need to acquire? What knowledge do you need to acquire to be able to do all this? So first thing, regular expressions. So essentially regular expressions are an enhancement to find and replace. So you must have encountered find and replace. So if you're using um, a text editor or using a word processor or a spreadsheet uh, or Adobe InDesign or all kinds of programs, they all have a find and replace functionality where you can find a certain bit of text and replace it with some other text. Now, a basic find and replace is quite limited. You cannot uh, just look for variable uh, variants. You can only look for a certain word or a certain uh, string and replace it with another string. Regular expressions are an extension to that system where instead of searching for a specific string, you write something which is more like a formula that explains to the computer what you're looking for and allows for variations. So, and um, I'll just grab some, doesn't matter, some text. So this is essentially a script we'll be touching on later. But uh, right now, we'll just look at this as a bit of text. And I just want to show you a little bit how these things work. So right now, we're in BBEdit. BBEdit is a text editor. And uh, it has support for uh, regular expressions or grep, as it's often called as well. So I'm going to use the find dialog in BBEdit. I have the grip mode turned on, and I also have the show matches turned on. And so first of all, you can just do searching. So if I type file, you'll see that BBEdit has this functionality where it shows you what is matching. So, and this is just a simple find and replace. So we're just looking for file, 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 file. Now, what I'll do is I'll make some changes. So I'm going to damage my scripts. I will make sure not to uh, save this. So I have sometimes it's file, sometimes it's full. So and if I bring up file, then I can see like this is not a match. This is not a match, but file, file is a match. Now, assume that I want to really match that fall as well in the same uh, regular expression, in the same find, because I would like to change this into XX, two Xs. So in regular expressions, I can do something like, for example, IO. So I have square brackets. And in between the square brackets, I can give it a list of characters. And that is a list that's an OR. It's I or O. So now we're looking for F followed by an I or an O and then LE. And now you see it's matching file, but it's also matching fall. See, and if I want to replace both of those by XX, I can just say replace all. And you see it's replaced XX here as well as there. So I've been targeting two or more different variants in one go. That's an extremely powerful uh, mechanism. 
Um, so we'll, we'll see more regular expressions as I go through the session. So you'll see more stuff happening. Now, what is important before you go too deep into regular expressions, uh, I'll fire up InDesign as well. And at the same time, I want to open a sample document. So the document I'm going to use is called Adobe History. It's a de demo document that came with Adobe InDesign CS3 long, long time ago. And it's part of, uh, it's just an excerpt, a few pages out of a book written by Pamela Pfiffner about the Adobe uh, publishing uh, revolution. It's an interesting book, so I put the link in the, the course notes. If you're interested, you can still buy the book on Amazon. So the reason why I use this document is, is fairly nice. It has a lot of styles and interesting constructs. So uh, there's a link text and threading and so on. So it's a, it's a good document to test stuff with. So and all I'm going to do with this particular document is just export it as an EPUB. So we have an EPUB to play with. So let's just say, OK, export as an EPUB 3. I'm not going to do anything to it, just export it. And while we're in Adobe InDesign, I also want to um, have a bit of a look around and show you the differences between the find and replace in Adobe InDesign and the find and replace uh, in BBEdit. Okay, the EPUB has been exported. So now I'm looking at the EPUB in my Apple Books program. So and you can see it's an EPUB. It, it's been published, blah, blah. And you see, I've been doing this more than once. So I'll just delete them for now out of uh, the books collection. Delete, that's fine. Right, so I'm going to add some stuff to this document. So what I'm going to do is just put, say, like in here, I'm going to add in a thin space. So, and on the Mac, I can use this show emoji and symbols, and I can just search for thin space. I can also use the, there's an InDesign menu to, um, and there should be, yeah, normally I get the thin space, but no, I don't. Dang it. Oh, yeah, I'll just use for, look for space, sorry. I know what I did. So I look, just look for space and I get a number of variants. See, and they're all spaces. Right, here it is, here it is, thin space. Okay, thin space, Unicode 2009. It's a little bit slow. Okay, Unicode 2009. So, and I can now insert this thin space into my document by just double clicking it. It's not fast. Come on. Okay, let's try copy it. Yeah, it's happened. See, so now I have a thin space here between B and Fort. That's a thin space. And I'm going to copy this text and paste it into BBEdit. So the reason my computer is a bit slow, it's decided to do a time machine right now when I'm doing my um, session. I should actually stop that time machine and that will make things faster again. Okay, so now I have this same text here. Um, and then we need to look for B fault. So here, that's where the thin space is. So if I want to find that thin space in um, Adobe InDesign, I can just do find. And then I can use the grip. See, like there's different modes of finding. I'm just using the find grip. And there's some pop-up menu that helps you 
express specific one so i can say find thin space and then find next t and it has found that thin space and now look at the uh, special code so it's a tilde followed by a less than sign so that's the magical formula in indesign to find a thin space now if i want to find that same thin space in um, pb edit i can try but I don't expect this to work. You see, it's it's not found. The reason being that regular expressions have dialects. So the basics of a regular expression is always the same. All programs use very similar constructs for regular expressions, but individual special characters or special sequences or special features vary and differ. So InDesign has this construct tilde less than for thin space. That construct does not work in BBEdit. Instead, you need to search for a backslash X and then the Unicode number 2009 that we just saw. So like if I see now, it actually has found thin space X 2009. So if I say X 2000A, no match. 2009 it's not 2009 it's actually hexadecimal so it shouldn't read it as 2009 so 2009 it found the thin space so i can find thin spaces in bb edit i can find thin spaces in indesign but how i express that thin space in the regular expression is different and that's the way it is so there's just different dialects and the only way to figure out which is which is by looking at the documentation. So there's other things. So in, um, you can also refer to a text that has been matched. So say, for example, I want to look for, um, let's say, any word of five characters, say, and I want it to be prefixed with the word the, so the, and then I say any five characters. See, so now it's finding the word the followed by a space so that's this one and then that period that stands for any character and i say and I, it has to be exactly five of any characters now uh, i would actually like it to be five non-space characters because you see it's the space web space well uh, i want to be have actually five characters that are not spaces so i can change this and backslash uppercase s means non-space character so this is now saying the word the a space and then a non-space five times so here i have five times a non-space and now suppose i want to uh, double up that uh, non-space and uh, do a find and replace so i want to refer to whatever the match was so i wanted to make the first first battle of the published publishing, the published publishing, uh, the world worlds, the close close. So that's what I would like to do. Doesn't make any sense, but just uh, to show how I can refer to the match. So the trick to do that is to put parentheses around the area of the regular expression that you would like to refer to in the replacement string. See, if I just do a replacement string ABC, that would just, if I say find or replace all, everything becomes ABC, but that's not what I want. I want to actually use that string that it matched. So what I will do is like the, and then I say backslash one, and I'll do another space, backslash one. So now it will actually make this the first space first. So it will take whatever five, the five characters were and replace that backslash one with whatever was matching and replace this one again with whatever was matching. Replace all. See now the first first, uh, whatever, there were a few of them. Uh, I forgot here, the print print and so on. So it has do that done that. So that's a very powerful feature that you can refer to whatever the string was that was found and you don't know up, uh, up front what that was and it will be different for each of the different matches so again in this uh, area there are dialects so bb edit uses the backslash other text editors might use a dollar sign it might be the dollar one dollar one instead of 
the backslash one, backslash one. So again, you need to look it up at the documentation. DB edit is backslashes. Uh, Sublime text is dollars. Atom uh, text editor is dollars. So it, it's, it changes. All right, so text uh, searching, uh, finding and replacing using regular expressions is something I really uh, advise you to make sure you know how to do that and how to form regular expressions. Regular expressions are complex in that uh, they're, uh, I describe them as uh, write only. So you can write them, but once you've written them and then uh, you come back to them a week later and try to understand what a regular expression does, that's very hard. So they're very hard to read. They're fairly straightforward to write. And that's also the way it is. It's not a user-friendly language, not at all. Okay, second bit on your tool belt, uh, like we've seen regular expressions, second bit is a text editor. So you need one or more good text editors. Make sure you don't use a word processor. So don't use MS Word. Don't use WordPad. Don't use uh, Apple's text edit. So all these programs seem similar to text editors, but they are geared towards word processing. And that means that they will try to help you with word processing and they will do things like, for example, change quotes into curly quotes just to be helpful. And that's all cool for word processing, but for scripting, that's death because it will destroy your script. It will destroy your XML file. It will do all kinds of things to whatever you're editing and it will be very hard to figure out what exactly happened. So don't use a word processor when you should be using a text editor. These pro the program that you use for editing uh, XML files, HTML files, scripts, you need to use a proper text editor. And there's a lots of good ones. So BB Edit and Text Wrangler, <clears throat> on the Mac, uh, TextMate on the Mac, uh, Sublime Text on Mac and Windows and Linux, um, uh, Atom that, uh, on all platforms. So there's a lot of good text editors. A lot of them are uh, freely available. BB Edit is a commercial one that I like. Sublime is commercial, but I like it too. But Atom, for example, is free. Now, Another thing that uh, happens with a lot of text, uh, let, let's say some text editors, not a lot, I wish there were more, is that they actually understand EPUB. So for example, BB Edit is one of them. So you can say file open and you can just open an EPUB as an EPUB. And it actually knows that the EPUB is nothing more than a zip file with stuff in it, like a mini website inside of it. And so BB Edit offers you the opportunity to look at it as separate files. So you can edit away to, into the files that are within that EPUB file. And once you save, you're actually saving into that compressed EPUB file, into that compressed zip. Oxygen XML is another uh, program that has that feature. So where you can edit a, a, an EPUB, a EPUB directly without having to decompress it first and then recompress it. Uh, another one is Atom, the Atom text editor. Uh, the links are in the course notes, so you can use Atom to directly e e edit EPUBs. Now, <clears throat> okay, while we're looking at uh, this EPUB, which is the EPUB that I had created straight out of InDesign, so we'll quit for now. We don't need InDesign anymore. So that EPUB will function as my sample EPUB. So one thing I'll do is I'll make a duplicate and I'll call it the original. So remember that it's the original because I want to be able to come back to the original EPUB as it came out of InDesign because we'll be transmogrifying it a few times. So that gives me something to fall back to. So I have this EPUB. So what I did is I found a little task that I want to perform and I'll perform it a number of times, each time in a, with a different approach, with a different uh, tool set, with a different way. So, but it will lead me to uh, a number of jigs and tools that you eventually can start uh, making yourself and building yourself. So it's just more about the way of thinking rather than what I'm actually doing. So. The exercise itself is futile, 
uh, there is no real benefit to it. It's just to show you what I would be doing like, and it's similar uh, to tasks that you would actually want to do on an EPUB. So the task I've uh, put forward is I want to, here, if you look at the body tag, I want to get rid of this style here. See, because to me, it doesn't really make much sense to have the body tag uh, have a repeated style attached to it. I would rather have this style be part of the CSS file. I degenerate style CSS. So what I want is something like this. I want to be able to strip this out and then go into the CSS and then add a body uh, styling. Where is my body? It's somewhere here. So say body. I say style instead of style. This needs to go. So essentially this would have the exact same effect. So you have this, you don't say, so uh, here the body would be stripped. So I haven't saved, so, so it's not uh, actually registered, but this would be gone. And instead the body would have some CSS attached to it in the generated styles file. That's an operation I want to perform. So now you can imagine I could do this with VBEdit or with any text editor. So if I want to use another text editor that's not BBEdit, I would have to decompress uh, the EPUB first, do the change, and then uh, recompress it. So uh, I, uh, d before I dive into all that, I want to also introduce another tool you could put on your tool belt, and that's a tool called Ecan Crusher. So again, the links are in the course note. So you can just, I already have it installed on this computer and on my Windows machine, so I don't need to re-download it, but you can just download it as a freebie. And it's a very simple tool. It only does one thing. So like, or actually two things, compressing and decompressing. So it's something I wrote a few years back and it, uh, I have both Mac and Windows versions. And what it does, I'll just show you, I'll just get rid of this file for now. So you see this EPUB here, all I need to do is drag it onto Ecan Crusher, this one, let go, and it will create a folder with the EPUB in it. So essentially it's converted this EPUB file into a folder. Then you can do stuff to that uh, EPUB file. You can edit away, change the XHTML files, do whatever you want. So, and I'll just for now, change the name, make that Adobe History 1. And then if you want to do the reverse, you just drag and drop the folder onto Ecan Crusher and it reverses. So you see now I have Adobe History 1 EPUB. So it's taken the folder and made it back into an EPUB. All of this is, is a relatively intelligent zipper unzipper. That's all of this, but the drag and drop makes it nice. So it's very straightforward to use. I'll get rid of these for now. So you've seen how it works. To configure it, you just uh, launch the program without dropping anything on it. And you see you have a little bit of configuration options. So you can say, well, I don't want to uh, overwrite or do want to overwrite, or I want to actually rename the existing. So this is all to do with how it behaves when you uh, would be overwriting something. What, what should it do? Okay, so that's configuring. So, okay, we know what the task is. So we know we want to uh, change that, um, that information. So first uh, option would be to use BB Edit and just do a global find and replace using regular expressions. And I'll, I'll do that first, maybe. So I'll grab this um, EPUB, open it in BB Edit. And EBB edit is smart, so I can just say, well, I want to find and replace this thing, this, and get rid of it. And I need to do it with a um, regular expression because this uh, th this body is 
it might be variant. There might be slightly different versions in different files. In this case, it isn't because it's a simple file, but there might be other attributes on there in certain files. So for example, I might have here in the history tree two, I might have another, some data, X, Y, Z equals. So just for the sake of arguments, so I'll save this. So now we know history two has a data X, Y, Z attribute in the body tag, and I want to retain that. I only want to strip that style away, but I want to retain any other uh, attributes on that body tag. So what will I do? Well, the simplest is to use uh, something that allows you to experiment like bbedit or sublime text that can show you what happens as you're constructing your regular expression. So I open up my find dialog and I say, well, here's a tab. So let's start with a single tab. I know it's gonna be a single tab or I could say, well, any amount of tabs. So the star now says a tab zero or more. That asterisk or that star says zero or more tabs. Then the less than sign. See, and as I'm typing, you see that uh, bbedit is following along. So now it shows that this is a match, but this div is a match too. So now I want to follow that by body. So now there's only one, the divs don't match anymore because they're not body, they're divs. Then I want to match the space. Then I want to match. And actually after that body, uh, I want to match anything up to initially up to that uh, greater than sign here that closes the tag. So what I'll do is I'll say, well, match any character that is not a greater than sign. So we've seen earlier, I did like IO and it matched I or O. So I could also do this. That means match the greater than sign, but it's actually the reverse. I want to match anything that is not a greater than sign. So I, this means not. So this is now, you match any character that is not a greater than sign right after the Y of body. But that's only that first space. So this now matches that first space. I actually want to match up to here. So what I'll do is say, well, zero or more of those. See, so yeah, and now it says zero or more, so it keeps on matching, 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 matching until it hits the greater than sign, which does not match the not greater than sign. So this explicitly says like anything that's not a greater than sign and this uh, asterisk I read as as many as you want. That's what I always say, like as many as you want, as many as you want of anything that's not a greater than sign. And then there's a greater than sign. Now. In this whole thing, I want to actually take out that style. So what I say is, well, actually, I want to match up to here and then start matching that space and that style. So well, I say space style. See, and now it matches anything that's not a greater than sign, but it stops here because then it starts matching that style equals. So and I can say style equals and then that style could be in, in practice, it isn't, but it could be changeable. So if I want to reuse this knowledge that I'm building here on other EPUBs, I might actually have different width, different height, maybe more attributes, uh, more style information. So I want to do like a very generic regular expression. So I'll say, well, match a double quote. And then I want to match a bunch of characters which are not double quotes and then a closing double quote. So this is the same trick as with the greater than sign, but now I'm going to say not a double quote. And again, as many as you want. So the asterisk is as many as you want. And see, like now it starts, it matched the double quote, and then this bit here matches all the style information and stops matching on the double quote because it says as many as you want of anything that's not the double quote. So as soon as it hits the double quote, it has to stop can't continue on. Then I follow that with a match of a double quote. And then I again want to match anything that's not a greater than sign. So I want a similar match to this. See, so now I continue on matching whatever is after that style. 
And finally, I want to match that last greater than sign. Okay, see, so now I've written a regular expression that matches this particular uh, body, but it also, if I grab another file, this one, and I do the same find dialog, see that it doesn't have that data, but also it also matches, even though it's slightly different. That That's fine, that's okay. So get this back. Now, the replacement. What do I want to replace that with? Well, there's clearly three segments in this bit. So first, there's all the text up to the style, ta the style attribute. I want to retain the bits before. I do not want to retain the style itself, the style information. And I do want to retain, again, the bit that goes up to the greater than sign. To refer to those matches, I need to parenthesize things. So I'll actually parenthesize the body. I won't parenthesize the space and the style, but I will parenthesize the last bit. See, so now I have two bits that are parenthesized. So this bit matches everything from the beginning of the line up to the uh, here, just before the space. That's this first parenthesized bit, this matching. And then the second parenthesized bit is starting after the double quotes here that finishes the style. And then it begins matching up to the greater than sign. And what do I want to replace that with? Well, I want to take the first bit and the second bit and just jam them together. And so essentially this bit and this bit get jammed together and that's the replacement. So what I'll do is now hit replace here. See, and effectively it's become body, blah, 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 and the style information is gone. So that worked. What I can do then is say, well, I want to do a global find, and I want to do it in this case in my disk browser in the Adobe History EPUB. So I'm now going to do it on all the files in the Adobe History. So this one has a data, that's Adobe History 2. The History 1 doesn't, so I'll just say replace all. And I'll say, well, save to disk, don't confirm before saving, proceed. It goes through it and it did 36 of them. So there is 36 of those files. And if I now pick any random of those files, you see the body tag has now no more style information. And the second one here, which I manually had put in the data, the style is gone, but the rest is still there. And then finally, I would have to change the style here. So I need to say, well, now where's my body? Keep on skipping it. Body. Uh, and then of course I forgot what the width and the height was. Save. So I'll undo. Can I undo? No. Oof. Well, okay. I'll just open up the original quickly. So I have the memory of a goldfish and I forget stuff. Okay, that's what I wanted. Plunk that into the body tag styling here, body. Save. See, and now I got an EPUB here, Adobe History EPUB, which is modified in that it now has a data attribute here and all that style info is gone from the body tags and instead it's in the styling. So this is approach number one, just using a smart text editor that understands EPUB and all I need to do is a global find and replace. And that's a valid way of doing things. The disadvantage is suppose now I need to do 100 EPUBs and all 100, I need to do the same thing. That becomes a little bit cumbersome because it's fairly quick to do it on one with a find and replace, and I can't, but eventually it gets tiresome. Okay, now I'll just look at the second thing, which is pretty much the same. So I'll just delete this transmogrified one and I'm just going to duplicate it and call it Adobe 
history. So I'm now back to square one. Oh, Adobe history. Come on. Yeah. Okay. And now same thing, but I'm going to decompress it using, for example, Ecan Crusher or an unzipper. It doesn't matter. And now I have just a folder with files and I could again use BB edits, but I could also use another text editor. For example, you could use Sublime Text. Sublime Text does not have the same features that e, uh, BB edit has. It can't open an EPUB directly, but it can open this folder. And then you can imagine I can do exactly the same, do a global find and replace, get rid of this, uh, eventually save the files and then recompress it using Ecan Crusher and I get the same effect. So that's the second option. Um, now, the third, another one would be uh, Oxygen XML, same uh, kind of approach uh, to what you would do with BB Edit. But now I want to get into a little bit of scripting. So now I want to touch upon scripting languages. So scripting languages, uh, there's many, many of them. So there, uh, there are a lot of popular ones and there's no particular one that is better than any other. So which one, which scripting language you use is totally dependent on what you're familiar with, what you're willing to learn, what the people around you use. So it, it helps if you're using the same language as the people around you, because then you can ask them for advice and they can help you out. So, so I'm go not going to make any recommendation of what scripting language you should use. It doesn't matter. Anything that works. But for this uh, session, I am going to use uh, a few example scripts that are written in two popular scripting languages. I'm going to use PHP and I'm going to use Python. So these are two fairly well-known common scripting languages. Uh, again, if if you're familiar with them, good on you. If not, but you know something else like JavaScript and Node.js, totally fine. You can use that just as well. So what I'll do is I'll just introduce a few concepts in scripting, uh, and I'll just use PHP to do that initial uh, initial uh, starting. So I'll just make a new file, and I'm going to save that on my desktop. And I'm going to uh, so call it demo PHP. Okay, so here's demo PHP. And now I'll start writing little bits of script. So, and again, if you can't really follow it, it's not important that you learn how to script from what I'm showing you. It's more that you start to understand the thinking behind it rather than being able to script. So you have to do it in your own time. You have to learn uh, from with lots of lots of examples. So to write a proper PHP script, I start with a magical uh, first line, which is less than sign question mark PHP. Uh, if it doesn't start with that, it, it's not a full PHP script. And I'm occasionally lying a little bit. So there is potential variations there, but I'm not going to go into that. So for now, just uh, know that in most cases, I'm telling you 90% of the truth. And I'm skipping over the, the boring bits that are actually going to make things more complex than they ought to be. So for now, this is what you need as the magical first line. And then I'll write my first uh, PHP script. And I'll write in hello world. See, uh, save this to disk. So all this does is essentially print hello world uh, in a command line session. So to work with scripts, we need to go to the command line. And that might sound scary, but it's worth doing it. So on a Mac, the command line is hidden in your utilities folder. So I have utilities here. In the utilities, there is a program called terminal. So you need to open up the terminal. And once the terminal is running, you can start typing command lines. So say like, for example, uh, you can also do an echo something something 
Let's say a different language. I'm talking command line language, which looks a lot like PHP, but it's actually not PHP. It's a different language. So the, the, that's the thing with these programming languages. There's hundreds of them, and lots of them look a lot like each other. So it, it quite often takes me some mental effort to think what language am I in? And some of them need semicolons, like PHP needs this semicolon, whereas this command line language doesn't, and so on. Unimportant details. Okay, now, with a command line session, I am in a certain folder. See, if you look at your Finder or your Explorer, you can have many uh, directories or folders open, and you can look at them at the same time. But there's only one that's at the forefront. For example, right now we're looking at Winnie. Or now we're looking at Adobe History, not Winnie. Winnie is in the background. Command lines have the same idea. You're always, the, there's one frontmost folder you're in. And it starts out with your home folder, like this little wiggly thing means you're in the home folder. And the first command that I want to show you is ls which in the Unix, Linux world, shows you what the contents are of the folder you're in. So this is actually the contents of my home folder. If I go to the Chris in the finder here, see, and it matches applications, CMAP tools log, the bin is here. So this, the ordering, the alphabetic ordering is slightly different. Uh, Apple's uh, finder will sort case insensitively, whereas this is sorted case sensitively. But uh, see, it's the same names, the same names. So you're actually looking at uh, the same folder. But this is from a command line. This is from a finder window. What I want to do is I want to go into my desktop, which is this uh, thing that we also see here. So all I need to do is CD space desktop. Now I'm in the desktop, see, and it helpfully tells me where I am at. The squiggly thing I know that's home. So now I'm in the desktop. If I do ls, same command as before, you see now I get a different list of uh, things. I see Adobe History, that's this one. Adobe History EPUB, that's this one. So I'm now in that, uh, in that folder. And you also see demo PHP. That's that thing that I just here created in um, Sublime. I can show what's in that um, demo PHP on the command line with cat demo.php. So, and then it essentially rolls over the screen whatever is in that file. So this is a little bit command line uh, tutoring. What I want to do now is I want to execute that demo PHP. And in order to do that, I need to tell the computer that it is a PHP program. So, I, and as I told you before, I'm 90% telling the truth. There is more to this than I'm mentioning, but that's not important. So if you know that there's more to this, be quiet. It's not important. So PHP followed by the name of the PHP script file, and then I hit return. And it says, hello world somewhere. Here, hello world. And you see, it's actually jammed up right next to that Winnie. So I've actually neglected to say, well, you need to take a new line. That's a special magical character, backslash n. So I'll do it again. PHP demo PHP, hello world. So we've run our first script. So I've used the command line and I've been running my first script. Now, before I go further, because there's a lot more to come, do keep in mind that eventually I'll take you away from this command line because the final uh, part of my session is how you can run these scripts without needing a command line. So if this doesn't all make total sense, that's fine because we'll actually get to a point where we don't need it anymore. But I do need to explain to you how it all works so you kind of can figure out why certain things work the way they work. So what I'll do now is I'll change my uh, script a little bit and actually let it gain more features. So I want my script to be able to process a file. So, and if I go and look at my EPUB here, that's my EPUB. See, now I'm going to use a trick that works both on Mac and Windows in command line sessions. I want to process this uh, XHTML file with this script. So what I'll do is I'll drag that file into that window, 
let go. And you see the finder actually tells the command line window what the full path is to that file. So now it actually has PHP demo PHP and then the full path to whatever that file was, which is in a totally different folder. It's somewhere else on my hard disk, doesn't matter. Now I'm going to hit return and nothing's going to happen because I have not yet made my demo PHP script work right. So, but if I just hit enter, it works fine. It still says hello world, but it has not taken into account that I actually put the full path to file there. In order to do that, I need to uh, use a special magical incantation again. And I can say, well, it's dollar argv square brackets zero. So this thing, dollar argv zero, that is actually whatever is after the, the name of the script from in the command line. So if I save this and I do um, php demo php chris, it says, oh yeah, sorry, I, I should have done one mistake on my part. Do it again. Hello, Chris. See, so what happens is argv1 is whatever follows after the demo PHP. And so it actually has said hello, and then this is kind of a placeholder. It's doing kind of a find and replace. This thing gets replaced with whatever I put on the command line. So if I then use that to process a, a file, it will actually process that file. Now, of course, this all doesn't make sense, but now I'm going to go one step further and actually use that script that I um, put there earlier. So here's a script called delete body style PHP. And this is using the little bit of knowledge we've gained to make an actual useful script. And it's exactly the same as what we did in BB Edit before, but now in a script. So doing this exactly same find and replace, but from a script. And what does this does is here, arg $argv1, that's whatever is after the script name. And then it's using a PHP magic word called file get contents, which will suck the file empty. Ah, not really. It will make a copy of the contents of the file and put it somewhere in memory. And we refer to it as file contents. And then it says, okay, take these file contents and do a regular expression find and replace on it. And you should recognize this is very similar, not quite the same, but very similar to what we did in BB Edit. See like blah, 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 with two parenthesized sub segments. And then instead of backslash uh, with PHP, it's dollar. So it's dollar one, dollar two. So we're going to remove the style. And then we end with the reverse from file get content, of file get contents, the reverse is file put contents. And we're going to put whatever the search and replaced file contents are back into the same file path. So what this little script does is read the file, do a find and replace, put it all back. Very simple. Uh, I have another one, which is called the lead body style pi, and that's a Python script, which is essentially the same operation, but expressed in Python, which is a different scripting language. So but very similar, you kind of kind of intuit what it is doing. It's opening. Again, you see that argv1 here, that's that, uh, that file path that's on the command line. We read it as in file, we put it in data, then we do the regular expression. And again, you see Python backslashes instead of dollars. We do this, uh, the substitution of a regular expression, and then we write it out to the same file. So if you, don't know how this works. So you could even just use these scripts as such and tweak the regular expressions here. So anything here between those single quotes here and there is that regular expression is the same as the one we used in BB Edit. So you could make slight tweaks and it would still work. Same with the PHP version. So now that we've got this delete body style PHP, let's open up one of those Adobe history files in Sublime, and I want it in a separate window. Okay, so you can see 
the body is there, the style is there, and uh, this, this thing I want to get rid of. This has to go. And all I need to do now is from my command line, instead of demo PHP, it becomes delete the body style PHP. So this is the construct, and I'll show you some more things. So, so what I'm doing now is I'm currently in the desktop. So I'm actually on my command line session. I'm in this folder. I'm telling the PHP program that I want to run the script delete body style PHP, which is this delete body style PHP. And I want to run that script on top of that, um, that file here, Adobe History 1XHTML, which I drag dropped into the window. So that's my command line, PHP, name of the script, then name of the file, full file path of the file I want to process. And I am currently looking at that file in one of my windows. So I'll bring that for the foreground. Okay, so everything's ready to make it happen. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll hit the return key now. Okay, and then if I go back to uh, my Sublime, you see it disappeared because that script has taken away that style info. So cool, but not quite a good solution because like in uh, BB Edit, we could do a find and replace over all the XHTML files. With uh, this PHP script, I just did one, but I want to do all of them. So there's multiple ways to do it. You could actually write a script so it would accept multiple files and I could actually process them with one script, but the solution I'm working towards works best with scripts that only process one file at a time. So now I'm going to go deep into gobbledygook. Uh, if this doesn't make sense, it do, doesn't matter because there will be a better solution soon. But for now, I'm going to show you how to do this from the command line, how to process all of those files in one go. And I've actually recorded a little command line command. So this is a command that I'm going to execute from my command line. And what it does is says, well, we're looking at a certain directory and that's this uh, OABPS directory in Adobe history. So the full file path to that directory is this here. That's users, Chris desktop, Adobe history, OBPS. It's going to make a list of all the XHTML files in that directory. And then it's going to read file after file, the name, essentially read file name after file name and execute in this case, the Python script, delete body style pi on that file. So, this magical little command line will execute the Python script over and over on each of those individual files. So I'll just pick a random one. Let's pick number 18. You see it has a width and a height. And now I'm going to paste in my magical command line. It's going to scan a directory. It's going to find all the XHTML files and it's going to run the Python script, delete body style pi on those files. Hit enter. Done. So you see that took a fraction of a second and you see it's gone and it's gone here too and it's gone here too and it's gone here too. So that's very cool, but it does need you to understand command line, which is kind of another scripting language. So you have PHP or Python or Node or whatever. And then the command line again has its own scripting language. And what I did here, this line is a scripting commands to multiply the operation that deletes the body style. Now, luckily, there is a way to make this easier, a lot easier. So the, the hard part that you would still need to be able to do is write these little scripts. But once you have a little script that can access this arc v1, whether it's Python or PHP or any other programming language, they all have those features. They can all do that. They can say, what is the first uh, file path after the name of the script that then work on that uh, file. 
and resave the file on top of the old version, once you have a script like that, you can use something called drop to script. So what I'll do is now close off some stuff, uh, get rid of stuff. So we don't want that Adobe history anymore. And instead, I'm just going to keep this Adobe history EPUB because the nice thing is that the solution that I'm going to show you also takes care of the decompressing and recompressing fully automatically. So what you need to do is you need to go to the BC Coop lib. I don't know whether uh, I pronounce that acronym right. So I have it. So this is a tool I wrote as a contractor for them. And it's called uh, Drop to Script. Oops, here in. Uh, and. So currently, so the proper link is in this course notes. You don't need, you need to follow me, but you can download here from release versions. The version I'm going to demonstrate is 1010, 1018. So drop to script is the application. The 1018 is the scripts that come with drop to script. So all I need to do is download this thing. Two clicks to... I don't know whether I clicked it. I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, there it comes. So it's 36 megabytes. And then decompress it. And it's very similar to the EPUB crawler. The EPUB crawler does not need to be installed. You can put it anywhere you want. So drop to script is very similar. You can just double click it. And then you see there's multiple versions. There's a Mac version, there's a Linux version. So drop to script is here. And with the Mac version of drop to script, you have to, after the download, right click this thing, initial setup, la di la, and open it. And then say again, click on the open. If you don't do it, it won't work. It's very important. Yeah, and you only have to do it once. Once you've done it, now drop to script is um, essentially de-quarantined. So drop to script is in, put into quarantine by Apple. And by running this command and actually saying, yes, I know what I'm doing, open, 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 then it becomes de-quarantined and it can work properly. So drop to script comes with a whole collection of what I call drop scripts. And these are all, in this case, PHP com commands, PHP scripts that do something useful or potentially useful. But uh, in this case, I'm just going to use the scripts I made here. And they are on the desktop. So, And I'm going to put copies of those scripts into the drop to drop scripts folder of the drop to script application. So what I've done is I downloaded it, uh, initialized it, and then I actually put my own scripts in the drop scripts folder. And these scripts, as we've seen, are very simple command line scripts that take as the second, uh, as the uh, after the name of the script as the following parameter, the full file path name of the file I want to modify. And now things become very easy. So what I'll do is I'll first go into BB edits and show you this EPUB is not modified. So I open it in BB edit and let's pick any of the files. So you see there's a style here and pick another one, 16. There's a style here. Cool. Close this. What I do now is I take that EPUB that we just see uh, saw and I drop it onto the drop to script application. There we go. And then it shows me a pop-up menu. And you see my two scripts are here. Delete body style pi, delete body style PHP. I can pick any of the two. I'll take the Python one, whatever. Doesn't matter. They both do the same thing. I click OK. And it will now go through that EPUB. And you see it has actually inspected 39 files. None of them caused an error. And now if I click OK, and now I will take the same <coughs> EPUB 
drop it onto BB Edit and go and have a look. And you see the body is now, it doesn't have that style info anymore. No more style info, it's gone. So the, the road to a drag and drop tool is shorter now. So you still need to write or create that script that can take a single command line parameter and do something to a file. But once you have that script, all you need to do is drag it into the drop scripts folder. And then you can do drag and drop of a complete EPUB and not have to worry about decompressing, recompressing, and so on. So the drop script, uh, drop to script program is configurable. And just like uh, ECAN Crusher, you just double click it to configure it. And this is an important bit. So you need to tell it what it needs to do with a certain type of script. So for example, if a script ends in period PHP, PHP file name extension, this here tells it that PHP needs to be executed with a program called user bin PHP, which is installed by default on the Mac. Or PY needs to be executed by user bin Python, which again is installed by default on the Mac. So if you install your own programming languages or you might install different versions of Python, that's totally fine and you can do that. So you can, and you can actually point it to a different version of Python. So I can just click here, for example, and I can say, well, uh, let's go to uh, opt local bin. So, and I see there's other, uh, so let's find a Python. See, there's a Python 3 here somewhere, Python 3. See, so I could actually tell it, well, I want to use Python 3 rather than Python 2. There's multiple versions of the scripting language. So you could actually point it to a different program to do the interpreting of your Python program. You can also assign a default. So I can say, well, the default script is delete body style PHP. And if I do that, I make this program become a one trick pony. So what I'll do is I'll uh, just get rid of my transmogrified EPUB and I'll take the original and call it Adobe History EPUB again. So if I were to open this in BB Edit, you would see the body styling is back because I went back to the original. So, but what I've done now is I've reconfigured drop to script to automatically do the removal of the uh, style information. So let's quickly open it in BB Edit so you can see that what I say is true. See, body has the style. Pick another one, body has the style. Let's close it. Now drag and drop this thing. Drag and drop this history onto drop script, drop to script. See, and now it doesn't ask me anything. It immediately starts processing because I told it, I want you to do the, that delete uh, body style. So if I need to process a lot of EPUBs, that's sometimes handy to say, well, I only want that particular script. And then once you're done, you just double click and you put it back to default script none. So you can prick from the pop-up menu. See, and if I were to inspect it, it would now contain. Now you also see that it has been making a backup file. See, there is a Adobe History old one EPUB. So this program will automatically make up to five different backups as you process and reprocess and re-reprocess an EPUB. And uh, number one is, uh, is always the oldest. So you can always get back to the original when you started using drop to script so it, it keeps the very first one and then keeps a rolling uh, set of backups as well as you go. So that's very cool. So I'll also show the same stuff on Windows because on Windows, things are a little bit more cumbersome. Right, so I have a Windows um, set up here and some stuff has already been installed. So the problem with Windows is that those programming languages, PHP and Python, are not automatically installed. You need to install them. And uh, there's a number of ways to do that. You can actually download executables that are just PHP and another executable that just Python. Or in this case, what I've decided to do is install something called uh, Sigwin. So Sigwin, uh, I don't know what it's short for. 
So you can just Google it. The links are in the course notes, but you can just Google Sigwin. And it has a download. There is a 64-bit version. There is a 32-bit version. So depending on your Windows, anything that you need to install is there. And that actually creates a Unix-like environment on your Windows machine so that you can actually access most of the same programs that I was using on the Mac. For example, Python and PHP and uh, zip tools and unzip tools. So it makes your Windows work more like a Mac as far as the command line is concerned, or more as a Linux machine as far as the command line is concerned. So Sigwin is actually a manager of uh, Unix programs. So by default, it's uh, not going to install anything. You need to tell it what programs you're interested in. So, And what I did is, uh, it's all documented in the course notes. I've installed all stuff related to Python. I've installed all stuff related to PHP. I've installed a few zippers and unzippers. And those things now become part of my Windows machine. So to use Sigwin, you can just uh, open up a Sigwin terminal. See, and this is very similar to the Windows terminal. The difference is that it is uh, Unix-like. So and I can normally make my screen bigger. No, plus, 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 plus. Make the fonts a bit bigger so that's easier to read. See, so normally on Windows you would type dir to see a list of the files, but because this is like Linux, you can type ls. Now, it starts out in a home directory that's not in a normal place. So you, if I want to go to places that are familiar, in this case, I'll just do a magical incantation, home path. If I do cd home path, I am actually in my uh, Windows home directory. So home path is the Windows home directory, and I need to put it between double quotes. So if I do ls now, this is all the typical stuff that you see in your Windows home directory. And let's make that, that a bit bigger. And so just like on the Mac, I can do CD desktop. And now I'm on the desktop. See, like you can recognize Adobe History EPUB, Adobe History EPUB. So there's a number of copies. So all those things are identical. I've also installed PHP and um, uh, Python in Sigwin. So these are essentially there. So if I just do like PHP, I can actually uh, on the go immediately type my echo hello world and then do control D, you see, and then it executes the hello. So now I've actually typed the PHP script and run it. So this PHP works. So what you need to do if you use Sigwin just like I did, you need to configure drop to scripts to use those programs. And I've done that here already. See, like uh, PHP, I told it. For PHP on this Windows machine, you can use Sigwin 64, the 64-bit bin PHP EXE. And for Python, you can use blah, 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 3.8, Python 3.8 EXE. So that integrates uh, the drop to script with the PHP and the Python that I installed with Sigwin. If you install a different PHP or a different Python, like with um, the downloads that you can find on various websites that uh, support PHP or Python, you can configure it to use those instead. But apart from that, it's just the same. So let's go here. I think this one, this one is my original, so I'll get rid of a few. Or easier is to go back to um, my real original. So I'll go to the Mac desktop and grab the original EPUB. And I'll get rid of these. And I'll just rename this to Adobe History. Okay, so now we can first open it in Atom, for example, rather than um, BBEdit. Okay, let's have a look. You see the style is there. And now I'm just going to drag and drop this uh, Adobe history on the drop to script. I've already installed those scripts. Um, I think. 
Yep, delete body style. I say OK. And then a progress dialog should come up. There it is. And just like on the Mac side, it will make a backup. Uh, it will also do the inspection. It will do the changes. And now uh, I have processed. So this is a kind of a short intro into scripting and what you can do with little scripts. So the course notes have a lot more info uh, on how to get things installed, but none of this that I show you will be enough for you to immediately pick it up and go, but it should point you to things you need to put some time into and study. Alrighty, that's it. So thanks a lot for that. And uh, I hope you got some information out of it. Thank you.